Texas Values Report. This is Jonathan Sines, president of Texas Values. Great to be with you on another glorious week in the state of Texas. Today is March 2nd. Does that ring a bell to you? Do you have any idea? Do you know what that day is? is are you thinking? You're like, oh, wait a minute. What is that? Oh, hold on a second. I should know that. Did I learn about history of Texas in school? Today is Texas Independence Day. That's the day in 1836 where Texas declared its independence. And it's been all kinds of fun since then. And, you know, I'm excited because next week I'm actually going on a trip. I'm a chaperone for a school trip for my uh, for my daughter for her seventh grade class to Washington on the Brazos. If you've never been there, it's near the Brenham area where uh, people got together to form a more perfect state to bring Texas into existence. And so a lot of, to celebrate when you think about the history, the significance that it comes to Texas and our independence and how important that continues to be with our identity, right? I mean, Texas is a very independent state in a lot of different ways. Sometimes we think of ourselves as like a whole nother country, but that's a topic I'll get into more at another date. But one of the reasons Texas gets a lot of attention is because of the work we've done on the pro-life issue. And so I'm excited about the guests we have today. If you're new to the show, um, we talk about the issues of faith, family, and freedom in the arenas of the courts, the legislature, and the media. And we do this every week through Facebook. We've got radio programs in Dallas and Central Texas that carry it. And it's also podcasted on a number of different platforms. So we're going to go for about half an hour with a great conversation today with a wonderful guest. Mark Lee Dixon is going to be our guest today. He's worked in the pro-life movement for many years. He lives and resides out of the state of Texas, but does work across the country. And a big part of his work has been a movement called the Sanctuary Cities of the Unborn, which does work to have local governments acknowledge the protection and the existence and the value of innocent human life at the local government level. And I'll let him talk more about that in a minute. But one of the reasons we have him on the show today is because he had a huge Texas Supreme Court victory last week. Mark, welcome back to the Texas Values Report. Great to be here. Well, it's good to see you again. I know we've run into each other here and there, and you've been to some events. You got the award last year that our organization gives out every year, the Kelly Shackelford Award, acknowledging some demonstrated leadership and really outstanding work on the areas of faith, family, and freedom that we give out to not an elected official. It's got to be a citizen who's done a lot of work. So you picked up that hardware last fall and you continue to do great work. And during that time period last year, this court case was in existence and we weren't sure how it was going to turn out. And I want to get into a little bit more detail about that in just a minute. But tell our listeners and our viewers a little bit more about the pro-life work you do and what the movement and efforts are that are generally called Sanctuary Cities for the Unborn. Sanctuary Cities for the Unborn is a movement that is passing local ordinances which make their community abortion-free. And so some of those look like explicit abortion bans, like we see in 50 cities across Texas, and other ones like the ones in New Mexico are what we call de facto abortion bans requiring compliance to federal statutes like 18 U.S.C. 1461 and 1462, which prohibit the mailing and the receiving of abortion-inducing drugs. And we have seen great victory. Uh, We're not stopping. Uh, We are right now in Bristol, Virginia. Uh, There's an abortion facility that was in Bristol, Tennessee, that crossed the border to Bristol, Virginia. And so we're working here in the great state of Virginia to do some work. We've got some work in Illinois that we're working on. And of course, we're continuing uh, to work in Texas and New Mexico and fighting those battles there. Well, when you're in Virginia, try to say hi to my good friend, Victoria Cobb at the Family Foundation of Virginia. She runs an organization similar to Texas Values, a family policy council for the state of Virginia. Okay, real quick, housekeeping thing. For our viewers on that are watching on Facebook, I'm going to go ahead and share this on my feed. I want people to do that as well um, so we can get a little bit more attention and traffic on this wonderful conversation that we're going to have with our good friend, Mark Lee Dixon. Okay, there I go. So try to lead by example. Um, Mark, 
you know, you've done a lot of work in the state of Texas. I know you're doing work outside of the state. Uh, and it just so happened to be, if you will, during this time period with uh, a lot of pro-life victories and attention around the state of Texas. Obviously, Roe versus Wade was overturned last year. But, you know, I have to believe, this is my opinion, I think other people share this. When you look at the heartbeat law, you look at some of the work you've been doing on the sanctuary cities of the unborn, just continued efforts of sort of moving forward in more governments embracing and being comfortable with the concept that abortion should not be allowed, babies should be protected at all stages of development. And so, uh, you know, in some of that, I, I want you to, to give a list of the amount of cities where you've done that, but uh, in just a second. But my point is, all of this activity was sort of going on during this time period, uh, even before last year, but sort of leading up to, you know, one of the most important years ever in the pro-life movement with overturning Roe versus Wade, the heartbeat law in Texas, other similar laws in other states being passed. But, um, you know, I, I have to, it's my opinion that your work too, um, helped create this culture or at least an awareness that, you know, you can have laws like this in place and the sky is not going to fall. The uh, community is going to embrace it and that it'll continue to be upheld. And so how many cities now have you had these um, ordinances passed that protect unborn children at the local level? 65 cities and two counties. Yeah. And and how long would you say you've been doing work to sort of just focused on the sanctuary city? of the unborn issue. June of 2019 was when Wascombe passed their ordinance and we've been at it ever since. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, I don't want to say it's been a short amount of time, but you can go back three years, maybe three and a half years. It hasn't been a long time. So right during that same time period where we saw a lot of buildup going into the 2021 legislative session for the state of Texas, and then obviously going into that, that Supreme Court term, where the Dobbs v. Jackson case out of Mississippi led to the overturning of Roe versus Wade. So a lot's happened in during that. And I think all these things collectively come together in helping some of the work that we're doing. But I know there's some people that don't like it, right? They, they have tried to uh, silence your free speech rights. And I want to talk a little bit about that huge Supreme Court victory on Friday, um, we put out a press release on it. We were part of an amicus brief, which is a friend of the court legal document that you file saying, hey, I support this side. Here's our legal reasons why this person should win. Of course, we were on your side. Wascom, Texas was mentioned in that opinion, right? I mean, this was sort of key to some of the argument that the abortion side was making where, um, you know, generally speaking, your comments that were made regarding abortion being similar or equating to murder, that was called into question. And and I want to stop, drop back for a second. Um, the law, I believe, is called the Citizens, the Citizens Protection Act, sort of in the legal field. Sometimes it's called anti slap So what you'll see is these defamation lawsuits will get filed against people really to shut them up. So, you know, they won't say anything because some other entity, it makes them look um, look bad, if you will. And, you know, whether they think it's accurate or not, they don't want the, anybody saying anything that, um, you know, paints them in a negative light. So they'll file a lawsuit. Usually people can't uh, afford to have a lawyer just to protect their First Amendment rights. So the legislature said, we're going to, we're not going to, we're going to have things in place. There's going to be a high bar that you have to meet to file these defamation lawsuits. Um, and so that's where the Texas Citizens Protection Act came into effect. I think in 2011, but um, generally, sometimes people call them anti-slap, um, and I'll get into that. What does that acronym um, stand for? I'll look it up in just a second. Um, I had it pulled up just a minute ago. Um, let's see. This is the short for strategic lawsuits against public participation. There we go. All right. Let me let me bring it back to you, though. They tried to shut you down because of you expressing your moral beliefs and concerns on this issue and the abortion side loss. Amen. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about that experience and how you felt on Friday when you found out you won. When I said these statements, I've said these statements for years. The pro-life and pro-life individuals across America, we've always said abortion is murder and the abortion industry is involved in the murder of innocent children. And so I was a little surprised that they were going this route originally when this was was filed. And, you know, they they put up a when Wascom outlawed abortion, they got upset. And I understand. 
uh, they, they didn't like the Wascom ordinance. We called them criminal organizations in that order. And that billboard in Wascom, Texas said abortion is freedom. And I said, abortion is freedom in the same way that a wife killing her husband would be freedom. Abortion is murder. And we saw this play out and, you know, it was interesting because during one of the court cases, I'm not sure if it was Dallas or Amarillo or where, but one of the judges asked, I believe it was in Amarillo, one of the judges asked the attorney for the Lilith Fund, uh, Mr. Dixon has said that uh, Lilith Fund is named, shares a name with a demon that preys on women and children. Are you suing him for that? And, and they, they said no. Um, but that they're, they're suing me for saying that they were involved in the murder of innocent children, that they were criminal organizations. And of course, when we saw the, the results come out of the, the case, uh, it was on in our, in our favor. That yes, I can say that abortion is murder and that the abortion industry is involved in the murder of innocent children. And yes, I can refer to these groups as criminal organizations because as Justice Divine pointed out, the pre-Roe v. Wade statutes were never repealed. They're sure. in force right now. And these abortion assistance groups have been violating those statutes for years. Well, and look, I mean, a lot of this is, you know, they don't like those kind of phrases being stated because in my opinion, okay, that is, um, you know, th that's something that gets people's attention and a lot of people do feel that way. And it's, you know, something they don't always think about. And so they don't want people having, in my opinion, an honest conversation and exchange about it because they want to just put themselves in the best light possible. But to your point, well, I don't all of a sudden that's an issue. Right. I mean, you've heard people say this for years and that that has long been the belief. Um, and, and certainly pre row Right. I mean, there were criminal statutes in place. Roe versus Wade was obviously overturned. The legislature has said there's no constitutional right to an abortion. Um, and I think that was what I enjoyed, too. The interesting part of that in the opinion, talking about, you know, the value in our country and in our society of having these debates and conversations and people being able to talk about um, from a moral perspective as well what their beliefs are and what they equate to. I, you know, it was a lot, a good bit written in the opinion, and certainly in the footnotes about the vegetarians sometimes saying meat is murder, right? And, and it's funny, this will date me. I came across a, uh, an album from a music artist from the 80s where that was, you know, one of the titles of the album, meat is murder, right? And these are like phrases that you've heard before people say, and that is the belief of some people, right? And so, uh, certainly our society can handle that. But it's interesting to me, too, that during this time period now also where it is illegal in the state of Texas. I mean, the laws have changed. The Supreme Court's changed on this issue. And we have the heartbeat law. And now we've got the um, life, the Human Life Protection Act, which said if Roe versus Wade is overturned, um, you know, the baby's protected through all stages. And so, um, so I think it's interesting, the timing of this. But it's not easy. I mean, how long did this go on that you've been having to deal with these uh, these legal attacks against your free speech rights? The lawsuit came in uh, on June 11th, uh, the anniversary of uh, Wascom Out Long Abortion, the one year anniversary. So it's June 11th of 2020. And I agree completely with Justice Divine. This took too long. The fact that it took this long to settle this issue uh, it's it's wild in my opinion. Yeah, because this is still at a preliminary stage. I mean, that's how this Citizens Protection Act is set up. These things are all an opportunity for these cases to get dismissed early. So you don't have somebody having their life disrupted and in many ways um, put on hold, if you will, or you know, being subject, subject to sort of this anxiety and concern. Gosh, what's going to happen and being held up in court on these issues? And so that is a good bit of time. And whatever the circumstances are, that's a long time to sort of have these things hanging over you. 
And part of what people are looking for is an opportunity to say, you know, this they're going to stop you from saying those things. They want to restrict your free speech. They want to control the debate. They want to control the discussion on this issue. And they want to stop you. They want to silence you from talking about things from your own perspective, because a lot of people share that belief. And for many people, that is how they see it. And um, and that matters. That's relevant to the conversation. And it shouldn't be one one sided. And, and look, I mean, for the, you know, it's almost as if they asked for it. If you want to say, I mean, are they invited that type of response by putting up such a big bull, a billboard and trying to, in my opinion, right, trying to convince people that it's some issue of freedom and, you know, I don't know, people are better off and, you know, we sort of have this uh, fundamental right to end the life of an unborn child. And, and I just think to some people, you know, it's too much, right? It, it, they may not have an abortion, but maybe they're, you know, they don't get into the business of what other people do. But if you're going to be so brash to sort of put up a billboard, that's like those T-shirts, right? I'm proud of my abortions. I mean, seriously, come on. And, and you don't see them selling that many. But when people are sort of bold like that, it almost merits someone saying, OK, if, if you want to really jump into this discussion this way, let's, you know, let's have a real debate on it. And um, and that's been a value of our country. But but you're right, a little bit too long, but good. I'm glad you got a victory. I'm glad we won. I'm glad this issue is behind us. And I think there's some good precedent there, though, moving forward, because I don't think the other side is going to go away, whether it's here or in other states, on the communication and narrative and how people talk about these issues. And another great thing about this, too, is uh, they have to pay all the legal fees. And so I mean, very, very thankful listen, for that. And, 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 you know, look, that's not money that goes into your pocket, right? People sometimes don't realize that you win a free speech case. What do you get? Your free speech, right? It's not like, but there are statutes in place and laws in place that say, if you've got to defend yourself and you've got to hire someone and all that, those attorneys oftentimes can say, you know what, I'll take that case because if I win, I can at least recover reasonable attorney's fees. And I don't know how that's going to play out. I'm not going to get into the business of all that. I will tell you my experience when it comes to people that don't agree with our issues, having then to pay attorney's fees, that ends up sometimes turning into a whole nother fight on its own. So those aren't guarantees. Whatever amount you start with, you may see that play out for a while. I hope it doesn't. But that is one way to send a, to message the other side. You know, it's going to cost you, so to speak, if you're going to try to push people around on this and you lose and so um, back up for a second. We're talking with Mark Lee Dixon. He is a pro-life leader, primarily in Texas, but across the country. Uh, one of the efforts that he leads is the Sanctuary Cities for the Unborn, where they pass ordinances at the local level that protect unborn children through all stages of development and recognize the value of the human child in the womb. And recently he won a Texas Supreme Court case because uh, some abortion groups tried to shut down his free speech, speaking his mind, his heart, and his values on this particular issue that, I mean, to me, it's factual, okay? But nonetheless, um, you had to go through the lawsuit, you won. And again, I'm not, you know, I'm not a guy to try to spike to football on our issues, but I don't mind uh, talking about the scoreboard. And what the scoreboard looks like is yet again, the abortion side has lost in court, particularly at the Texas Supreme Court. Those losses got to be stacking up over there on their side. And, and I'm not saying that to be to brag or whatever, but I mean, how can people not start to take note of that, particularly their side? They continue to lose time and again. And I hope that means we're going to see sort of a reduction in, you know, the, the way that they operate. And, you know, look, I, you know, I think a lot of these groups are vulnerable now that they can't perform abortions in Texas and some of the bigger states. Um, you know, look, it's been two or three days. Um, anything you've reflected on since then? that now you move forward and you know that you can start putting sort of this uh, behind you and have all your focus on the great work you're doing. Well, I told someone before this ruling came out and my position's the same, that there's always going to be attacks from the enemy and all of his minions. Uh, and groups like the Lilith Fund, groups like, um, uh, Planned Parenthood, they're always going to be uh, fighting this and until the day that their organizations close up. And so I'm expecting there, there'll probably be another lawsuit filed in, in the near future. 
uh, and we'll fight that one too till the end. Uh, but in the midst of these things, what do we see? We see today, uh, believe it was today, that the largest, uh, the the very well, the very first abortion facility in Texas um, going bye bye completely. Uh, Curtis Wayne Boyd. Uh, That's in Dallas, Dallas, right? Dallas facility. Yes. Uh, you know, Curtis Wayne Boyd was the one that was doing abortions in Athens, Texas, illegal abortions. And he ended up leaving uh, to go to New Mexico prior to the Roe v. Wade ruling. But then once the ruling came out in 1973, he came back and opened up the first, uh, quote unquote, legal abortion facility in Dallas, uh, Texas. And now uh, it has been functioning as a referral facility uh, for uh, referral clinic, and now it's closing its doors completely. And to that, we say praise God that there is uh, an end to some of these abortion groups in Texas. Yeah, no, and, and it's a good point. Right now, um, a lot of groups around the state are involved in the Forty Days for Life campaign that is during sort of the same time period has lent the 40 days leading up to um, Good Friday and Easter. And, you know, it's like, well, where do you go pray now since they're not doing abortions? Well, some of these abortion facilities, these Planned Parenthood offices are using those offices to then be a place for referrals out of the state and things of that nature. Or they're involved in other issues related to LGBT stuff, you know, uh, transgender. I mean, who knows what else is going on there? And so there's good reason to continue to pray for an end to all those things and, you know, celebrate, be grateful, if you will, that one has closed. So there's not anything going on there because, you know, you just have to imagine some of the stuff they get involved in. uh, There's nothing good coming out of it, in my opinion. And I also think because um, of some of the connections that the abortion movement has had with the transgender issue, LGBT, all these other different things, uh, you know, Glad to have those things coming to an end as well. And I do think it'll get, to, it'll, you'll see more of that. I hope we see more of them closing and not being involved in any business. We're in the middle of the legislative session, Mark, and I know a lot of great work. I'm hoping to see you here up at the Capitol. But um, I, I do think, you know, whether it's alternatives to abortion, shutting down some of the chemical abortion stuff, tell us about, uh, you know, I think these are good things for lawmakers to know about. Um, You mentioned before we came on, there's a lawsuit, uh, I think, in the Panhandle or Amarillo area that relates to these medical or chemical abortion issues. What's going on on that issue, that ADF case? Well, and and there's actually two cases. Uh, One, there's an Amarillo case that's really important that we're looking at right now. Uh, And then there's a case in New Mexico that actually is a Sanctuary City case. Uh, New Mexico AG sued uh, two of the cities and two of the counties over there that passed ordinances. And in both of these cases, these federal statutes, 18 USC 1461 and 1462, prohibiting the mailing and receiving abortion-inducing drugs are mentioned. And this is something that is going to have to be addressed uh, by the courts. Uh, The Biden administration has said that these federal statutes, uh, they've taken a position against them. But they were passed by Congress in 1873. Uh, They uh, are superior to all state laws and uh, state constitutions. And if they were enforced, they would shut down abortion in America. And so that's why so many people are looking at this case. Uh, This case in Amarillo really could, uh, or the one in New Mexico, could lead to the end of abortion, uh, chemical abortion in America. Which is over 50 percent by some people's estimations chemical or medical abortions these days. Hey, we're about to run out of time. Want to make sure everybody know March 13th, Monday is our Texas Faith and Family Day. We're going to talk about the pro-life issues, religious liberty, marriage and family, school choice, save women's sports, a whole lot of good stuff there. Check that out, texasfaithandfamily.com. March 13th, Monday is coming up. Mark, listen, I'm so excited that you won. <laughs> I love being on the winning end, um, but I know it, it it wouldn't have stopped you from doing what you do, but I do think it sort of maybe moves that out of the way. I hope there's not an uh, additional lawsuit, but I know if one comes, you'll be ready for it. But uh, And we'll continue praying for you too. Just important pro-life work that you're doing. Always good Texans out there doing great work in other parts of the country. And so, hey, keep it up. God bless you. And thank you for being a guest today on the Texas Advisor Board. Thank you.
Well, it's good to catch Mark for a minute. I just got a couple of minutes left as he peels off. And I want to do a little bit of wrap up, but a couple of announcements I want to make sure people are aware of and know that um, that we've got coming up. I mentioned this while Mark was on, and um, I want to make sure I emphasize that the Texas Faith and Family Day is on March 13th. That is a Monday, and it's an all-day event. We have buses coming from the Dallas area, and also we have buses coming from the Houston area, and there's still seats on the bus, okay? So if you want to take a bus in on Texas Faith and Family Day on Monday, March 13th, the Texas Capitol, there's still room. Uh, maybe you want to get a couple of friends together, and it's very, I mean, it's all, I got to use, I had to use the word cheap. It's very inexpensive, okay, to ride the bus down. I think one of the deals we had was like $20, to ride a private chartered bus all the way to Austin to go back. You can't really get cheaper than that. And uh, I think it includes lunch because you're going to want a box lunch. So we're going to spend the day at the Capitol. We're going to do some training. We're going to have some guest speakers in the morning. We're going to do a rally on the South Steps at noon. Then we're going to eat lunch. And then the second half of the day, we're going to match you up with your House and Senate member so you can connect with them on these issues and let them know what you uh, what your concerns are and legislation that they need to get passed, like House Bill 23, the Save Women Sports Law. It's been announced by Representative Valerie Swanson. She's got a majority of the House already signed on as co-authors. Mays Middleton has a similar bill in the Senate. Lieutenant Governor has mentioned that that's a priority. The governor's already said it's a priority for him to pass. So a lot of good momentum on that issue and others. But March 13th, Texas Faith and Family Day, there's still tickets available, available texasfaithandfamily.com. Is the website you can go to our website txvalues.org and see the link to get signed up for that. And you know, look, I mean, we're you know, it's Texas Independence Day, we're in March. I mean, we're probably just about halfway through the legislative session. Things are going to start moving very quickly. Hey, for our friends out in Fort Worth, mark the date May 5th. We got some announcements about coming an event coming up there. You might have seen Save the Date September 15th and 16th. Our policy forum is on the calendar, that's in the Austin area. Mark those calendars. And listen, if you see value in our work, okay, our fiscal year ends at the end of the June. We're getting pretty close to that. Consider a tax deductible donation, okay? We're the largest faith and family nonprofit organization in the state of Texas. Collectively with uh, the two organizations we have, our budget's about $2 million. Uh, we need to continue to stay healthy as we go through the legislative session. We focus a lot on our work at the Capitol. And you can help us do it. By making a donation today at txvalues.org, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. And together with your help, that's how we'll protect faith, family, and freedom in the state of Texas. And we'll talk to you next week on the Texas Values Report.